Hi everyone, let's continue our conversation about steps for developing a quantitative study. Like the previous presentation, this one should also apply to those of you interested in qualitative studies as well. So as you begin to think about your topic, you're going to sort of naturally dive into reviewing the literature, defining a problem or an opportunity, developing a research question, reviewing the literature, going back and maybe refining your research question. The point is that this is very much an iterative process and that you're going to be moving throughout these stages multiple times as, as you begin your dissertation research. So now that we've talked about developing a topic idea, let's jump into a literature review and then isolating and defining a problem. As you're conducting a literature review, it's helpful to develop some keywords, like three to five or so at a time, for searching in the library or via something like Google Scholar. Google Scholar is pretty useful because you can also connect it to your library as well, which is pretty fun. Um, but some keywords, so alternating words like for instance, sometimes I'll type in undergraduate or college student or just college. Um, there's multiple ways for describing your population um, or your topic. It's helpful to aim for peer-reviewed resources only. There are a number of predatory, usually online journals, that actually charge authors to publish. Um, and so be very wary of those uh, types of journals when you might encounter them. I have a good example that I'd be happy to share with some of you off the record, <laughs> but it involves um, using an expletive and that expletive phrase was the entire published paper, um, in short, because uh, this predatory journal reached out to some scholars and said, publish in my journal only $500. And they said, sure. And they submitted just like a couple of words featuring an expletive. And then that actually got published as a journal. So <laughs> that's kind of a fun example. Um, but I'll talk to you about that maybe off the record sometime if anybody's interested in learning more about that journal. There are some other predatory journals even in the field of higher education. For instance, the College Student Journal is a journal that charges authors, I think it's like $600 to publish in them. So they're not seen as very legitimate because it's essentially just pay to publish. Um, newer uh, research is not always better. Sometimes you just have to cite um, the original sources to establish some credibility. Um, it's really important too, as you're writing, that you avoid the phrase as cited in. So if you're writing about Bandura's work, and Bandura wrote in the 50s and 60s, you might see that somebody else is writing about Bandura's work in 2017. You, you have to go back and cite Bandura's original work. Do not cite Bandura as cited in Soria 2019. You really want to avoid that. Just go back and get those original sources. And then finally, it can be really useful to review some bibliographies or references of published works that in ways to get more resources. So as you're digging into the literature, lots of other folks have written about your topic too, and go and look at their resources and, and follow that trail to find as much literature as you can on your topic. As you're thinking about identifying a problem, keep in mind that your problem should be legitimate and documented, so other people have published about it, and it's not just your personal pet peeve or your personal agenda. And if you refer back to the prior PowerPoint presentation, you'll see that I discussed that in some length, right? This has to go beyond just you have an issue with something or you've seen an issue with something in the world, but it has to be well documented and it needs to be substantial. Um, you'll need to find lots of hard evidence to substantiate your claims. Consider whether or not uh, you've got enough evidence that is significant enough to actually warrant future research um, or to use resources to pursue an investigation. Um, so you're going to put a lot of time and energy and effort into your dissertation, and those are all resources. And it's really similar to asking, you know, at the supervisor something like, can I take, you know, 10 hours a week to go and explore this research topic? Um, you better, you know, have that problem substantiated. So similarly, it's almost like going to a partner or spouse or family member or friends or, you know, somebody that you're, you're not spending as much time with because you're writing your dissertation and saying, hey, I need to go spend some time researching this topic. Um, that better be significant enough to warrant that type of energy and investment. 
Um, you can also think about a problem from the stance of maybe there's an opportunity that's too good to overlook. Um, it's too unique, it hasn't been done before, and it's an important. And that's another way to think about problems. But essentially, you always need to start with a problem. You can't just have an opportunity dissertation. You can't go into it saying, well, we have a, really have a great opportunity to study whether this mentorship program can help students of color to be successful. Um, that's not sufficient. You first need to tell us whether or not students of color are maybe not being successful, and that's why they need the mentorship program to see if that will help them to be successful, however that's defined. Um, so, so you need to kind of think about it in those terms. Um, so you could have a pro an opportunity, certainly, but there still needs to be a substantial problem underlying that opportunity, because the opportunity has to be designed to fix something. It's useful to think about your research agenda as sort of a funnel moving from something large and global to something really specific and focused. So for instance, there's significant social problems in the world today that demand new leadership. And you could write about poverty or racism or classism or you know big worldly events, climate change, right? Big picture. Now we're getting more focused. Society has traditionally looked to higher education to develop citizens and leaders to tackle those social problems. And there's a number of policy reports. Um, for instance, I often cite a couple like the Wing Spread Declaration on Civic Engagement, um, the A Crucible Moment, which is another policy brief, um, calling upon higher education institutions to better develop leaders for the future. Um, so, you know, okay, so now we're focused on like there's big social problems falling down to higher education is supposed to graduate people to fix those problems. Yet, college students are graduating without the capacities necessary to affect social change. Again, in each one of these, you need to cite your information, you need to get really specific, and you need to use some data to back up those claims. So that's traditionally how we would write a problem statement. Um, it's not enough just to have a gap in the literature and say, like, we need to fill this gap in the literature. If there is a gap, okay, who cares, right? Answer that question, so what, so what, right? You're kind of continually asking yourself that question, so what? We don't know enough about whether mentorship programs are useful for first-generation college students. Okay, so just because there isn't research on it doesn't mean it matters. Well, it matters because First-generation students graduate at a rate of 30% in seven years compared to non-first-generation students who graduate at a rate of 80% in seven years. Oh, okay, now we're interested, right? Now, now we know why this gap in the literature should be filled. Keeping in mind in general that really good research questions are answerable, focused, clear, and then also a little provocative as well. So as you're thinking about that so what or who cares question, which should be kind of always at the back of your brain knocking on the door, um, consider what will happen if somebody doesn't pursue this research. Consider why the population is important. If you're looking at a particular site, so I've had a lot of students write about um, international schools abroad. So they, they, I work with a lot of students at a different campus who attend, or I'm sorry, who work at um, American schools that are located in international locations. And so they'll, they'll essentially just want to survey their students because it's a convenient sample. But I will push them on, why does your school matter? Why does research on international schools matter? And I'll really push them to get the evidence that like, yes, the, you know, these schools are so important, we cannot overlook them any longer. And as an example of that research, they often write about how those schools are growing. Um, they're doubling their rates every year. Um, they're becoming more popular um, with citizens. So something like that is really important. Uh, and yet they're unregulated. You know, I mean, there's so many other arguments that you could make there. Um, go beyond, hey, there's just a gap in the literature and you need to address why that gap even matters at all. As you're thinking about your study design in general, um, and of course this looks different for qualitative folks, um, but for quantitative folks, um, you know, descriptive questions are probably not sufficient for publication. So what percentage of first generation students graduate in seven years? Um, you'll get your answer in two seconds and that's not enough for a dissertation um, or for publication. 
Uh, most of you will probably not be able to engage in experimental research um, just due to ethics and the challenges and logistics of doing so in higher education environments. For instance, you probably could not randomly assign faculty members to, a, to attend a workshop on students' mental health. It just doesn't really work that way in higher education. Um, you'll probably engage in the survey if you're conducting quantitative research. Um, a few other things to think about, there's quasi-experimental methods using what are called propensity score matching techniques, which are pretty interesting. Um, causal comparative is, is sort of built into the survey process, but you might have reverse effects that might be coming into play. That's something to think about. Um, if you can use existing data, I highly recommend it. Um, action research is really fun and it's awesome to work with community partners but it is incredibly time consuming and i do not recommend it for a dissertation um, and the same with mixed methods um, just pick one or the other qualitative or quantitative and it's funny i just co-taught a, a research seminar for doctoral students at a different university and the first thing out of my mouth that i said to them was like don't do a mixed methods research study a second instructor came in two days later and said, oh, why would you ever want to do mixed methods? And then a week later, we had a guest speaker come in who said, why would you want to do mixed methods? Don't do it. <laughs> in general, just pick a methodology, save yourself some time, and graduate, um, whether you choose qualitative or quantitative. You can certainly gather all the data that you want to and then continue publishing about it after your dissertation. But for your dissertation, just pick, just pick one. That would be my recommendation. As you're thinking about your study design, um, population and sampling is, is really critical to consider at this point. Thinking about why this is the best group to study. Um, variables need to be justified. So if you're going to uh, ask a survey that's like 100 questions long, you need to be able to convey to your reader, here's why I'm looking at all of those measures. You often don't need surveys to be that long or that lengthy to capture what it is that you need to capture. In fact, the shorter, the better. Um, and then your methodology, thinking ahead about how you're going to analyze your data, and then, of course, um, engaging in your data collection. So as you read about in your book, um, some of the more quant common quantitative questions are whether there are significant relationships between two variables or, you know, sometimes we like to control for the confounding variables to see if they get in the way. Um, we're not really going to be able to examine the treatment effects of anything unless you engage in experimental research. But again, that's extremely rare in educational research. We often look at if there's statistically significant differences between groups. Um, so if males versus females versus transgender students have different ACT scores, for instance, um, or we often talk about uh, variables that mediate or moderate relationships, but that's a bit more advanced than we will learn in this class. We're really gonna look at in this class, bullet point one and bullet point two. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about developing a topic idea and literature review, it might be helpful to think about um, what that might look like. Uh, for the final lab assignment for this class, you're going to be asked to think about this type of work as you analyze the thriving quotient data. Um, and so, you know, we implemented the StrengthsFinder assessment on campus, as we mentioned before in the prior presentation and we were interested in whether or not that had any impact on student success. And maybe what is it about um, the strengths finder that might have had an impact on success? So um, if you're interested, you could engage in a really quick literature review. Just Google search um, strengths finder college students, strengths finder undergraduates, see what's out there, see what might be missing, see what's sort of unknown. Um, and that can help you then to identify the significance of the study. As we think about problem statements, you want to focus on problem statements that are really research driven, facts and statistics based. So one of my students once wrote something like, researchers don't know enough about using inclusion in elementary international schools. And I think that that is a statement that we need 
gaps that really need some finessing, right? Because again, it's like, that's an interesting gap, but who cares? Um, and by the way, the term inclusion um, is referring to including um, students who have special education needs um, in a general classroom. And so that's a good example too of you have to be really careful about assumptions that people have about knowledge. Um, because I had my students in my doctoral seminar class look at that question and the higher ed students were like, what does inclusion mean? Like how inclusive the teachers are, how inclusive the curriculum is, and all the elementary education teachers were like, no, that means including secondary, or that means including special education students, duh. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to be really clear um, with your terminology. That's a really good case in point there. Um, but, you know, improving that statement, so think about ways that you might improve it. Well, one is we would want to know what's going on in elementary and international schools. Why, why is that an important site to be studied? Two, we need to understand inclusion better. So what percentage of the population is special education students? If you have a school of 2,000 students and only one is a special education student, um, that may not be large enough to warrant a, you know, a study. If 10% of those students are special education or if we're seeing rises in special education students, like in the numbers of them, um, one thing that we know in the data is that special education teachers tend to have extremely high rates of turnover and burnout. And so maybe that's why we need to study, you know, these inclusive techniques in schools um, to see if we can prevent teacher burnout. But in short, as it's written, that's not a problem. Just because we don't have the research doesn't mean that we need the research on this topic. So we need to get at um, proving a problem. Um, so again, just a little bit of practice, something to think about. Um, if you want to know whether the StrengthsFinder assessment has an impact on college student success, we need to think about whether or not there's a problem related to that. So is there a problem with college student success is the question that I would ask, right? Why are we spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year um, allowing students to take the strengths finder and learn their top five strengths and engage in strengths programming throughout the campus? Why are we doing that? Is there, is there a problem behind that? Do we have low graduation rates or retention rates? Or is that, you know, once you've sort of spent a minute Googling the strengths finder, you'll find that um, some of the benefits also include uh, being uh, better prepared for to enter the world of careers. So it's really useful to uh, you know, use your strengths or talk about your strengths in a job interview or help you um, help individuals to choose majors and, and so on. Um, so, you know, are, are there problems in those arenas as well, right? So that's the opportunity, the solution is offering the assessment. Um, but what's the problem? Why are we even doing that in the first place? Um, so those are just some, some things to kind of think about and start gelling in the back of your brain. Um, because again, we will be referring back to this type of research as we engage in um, the labs um, for your final projects. Uh, thanks so much. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.